Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, as you know, we have an exciting talk about Mountain View Cemetery coming up very soon. Um, this is part of our 2023 Fall History Series, which is a series of events put on by the Oakland History Center. Um, if you have not been to the Oakland History Center before, we're upstairs on the second floor of this building. We're primarily a research institution for any topics about Oakland or the East Bay. So we're open the same hours as this library. So anytime you have a question about Oakland um, or something you're curious about, come on up and we can help you try to find the answer. Um, you can make an appointment or you can just walk in. And we've got some, a few other events coming up in the fall history series. We've got this flyer right here. There's copies over on the table there. There's just a couple left. Um, there's on November 7th, Santi Elijah Holly on the Shakur family. Um, it's an author talk. Um, and then there's an event that's just for teenagers, which is a creative writing workshop where they're gonna use some materials from the Oakland History Center collection as inspiration for creative writing. So those should both be great. Um, and there's also two exhibits you can see right now in the library, one up on the second floor about Dr. Marcus Foster and another one on the first floor about um, women of the Black Panther Party. So come back, I know you don't have time to see it all tonight, but come back another time. And while you're here, look around the building, see if there's anything you can imagine about this building that you might think could be better. Because right now, the main library is in the process of a feasibility study um, to determine whether we should remodel this building or um, build a new main library. There are a series of events coming up. The very next one is actually tomorrow at Defremery Park, 6 p.m. So take one of these flyers, um, has the info about the next two events. There's another flyer as well about the feasibility study where you can find out about general updates. So please help us out, tell us what you think about our library. Um, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Lisa Ruth Elliott and Chris Carlson from Shaping San Francisco. We are co-presenting this event with them. They're from Shaping San Francisco. Hi everybody, I'm Chris Carlson. This is Lisa Ruth Elliott. We are Shaping San Francisco, having our 25th birthday. We're very happy to be here in Oakland. I actually grew up in Oakland, so it's a nice homecoming for me. I lived in San Francisco for a long time, but uh, I went to Oakland Tech, I went to Claremont Junior High. I had a whole lot of uh, street life here in Oakland as I grew up back in the period from 67 to 74. So, uh, uh, illustrious time in history. I'm excited about how much Oakland history has been appearing over the last few years. These incredible volumes of new writing that have come out about you know, the geology, the history of Oakland's development, you know, all these different books. It's just re really astonishing. And our website, some of you will know, one of the main things that we do as Shaping San Francisco is we maintain a website called foundsf.org. How many people have ever looked at that website? Yeah, a good number. <clears throat> so that's really a sprawling archive of the city, and we like to always emphasize that this is a, a living archive that you can contribute to, and you don't have to only be in San Francisco to contribute to. We have a fairly uh, ever-expanding section on the East Bay. We have North Bay, South Bay, Peninsula, et cetera. We actually aspire to being foundsfbayarea.org. We have the, have the URL. Someday we might use it. Um, but anyway, so that website is not only uh, serves as a place where you can access complicated, forgotten, suppressed, and lost histories of the Bay Area and San Francisco in particular, but it's also a place where you can add your own stories. And we really want to emphasize that, you know, most of us are trained in modern America to think of history as something that you watch or experience as a spectator or experts do it and you consume it. We completely reject that idea. We actually think that each and every one of us is a historical agent and we're engaged in making history right now by having chosen to be here in this moment. And everything that we do together is historically relevant. It doesn't always get written down. Maybe it shouldn't always get written down. Not every minute of our lives is very interesting. But the things that are interesting, for the most part, that happen to you will not get written down unless you do it. And this is a place where you can actually put it where other people can then access it over time as the, uh, history unfolds going forward. And this itself is already an incredible resource for future historians. So there's lots of ways to look at what the work we've been doing. We also do a lot of public programming. So this is our calendar for this 25th anniversary fall. 
We've been at it since the beginning of 2023, celebrating our 25th year. Uh, we rolled out with CD-ROMs and public kiosks. Yes, yeah, since the beginning of 2023. Our talks and programs? No, you've just been celebrating the 25th anniversary in 2023. I see. Uh, yeah. In any case, uh, there's a lot of that stuff that's also online. You can access it by way of both FoundSF and ShapingSF.org. Walking tours, bicycle tours, urban forum, walk and talks. We've explored every odd corner of San Francisco wow. since the pandemic. We decided the heck with Zoom. We're not interested. Tell them about Cemetery Week. Oh, yeah. And we're in <laughs> Cemetery Week. Thank you for that reminder. So this is a, a sort of a, a curiosity that we put together. This event is right in the heart of it. We had the first event it was on Saturday night. We did a walking tour of the Valencia Corridor <clears throat> with uh, our friends from the, Rad the Radical South Asian uh, History Walking Tour, a Berkeley one, that is. And uh, they brought the South Asian history to it. But this is a map that we did about a year ago having to do with the, the deep Irish history of that whole part of the Mission District and the fact that there were so many mortuaries along there. And the streetcars were actually funeral cars that would pick up the caskets and take you out to the cemeteries in Colma. And so there's a whole history of, of uh, funeral homes and Irish car men running the streetcars and lots of different complicated histories as well as the heart of lesbian culture and the heart of early punk rock in San Francisco, the Valencia Street's rich. And then this is the second event tonight on Mountain View Cemetery, another uh, worthy topic with a lot of deep history around it. Saturday, we're gonna take a walking tour of Lone Mountain, which was the heart of the big four cemeteries in San Francisco before they were all rudely evicted and uprooted and sent off to Colma. And then on Sunday at Colma, I'll be doing a bike tour. Uh, we'll do it together actually. and. Um, we're going to cruise up and down all the steep hills of the cemeteries out in Colma and show you where all the dead bodies are buried. So if you want to get a, a deep insight into some of the really criminal act, uh, activities of the richest and awfulest people in San Francisco's history, come along on the bike tour on Saturday, on Sunday rather. So that's a quick view of what we do. Obviously, you can spend a lot more time thinking about uh, you know, checking it out. We have books for sale over here. So if you're interested in picking up any of our publications, there's quite a bit. And then I'm going to hand it off to Lisa Ruth to introduce the evening. So posters, and um, we have a handful of these maps. This is not the South Asian uh, radical history. This is really just Irish history with a project to map the history of Irish carmen and funeral directors and florists and bar owners throughout the decades along Valencia Street. So we have a handful of those if you want to take one with you. It's also online on davidrumsey.com which we are very pleased that he saw fit to put that up. Um, so we also have stickers, so grab a sticker. Remember that it's the 25th anniversary. And in terms of history, um, well, Liam O'Donoghue has been around for a while. Um, I remember when he was doing a show on enemy combatant radio and writing for Indie Bay, um, then went on to work at Salon.com and is now a local radio personality on KPFA, um, but you probably know him best through uh, East Bay yesterday. And if we want to talk about participatory history, I think Liam is a, an amazing chronicler of those people who have made the East Bay what it is and have made the life rich and varied and decadent and full of culture and pizzazz and all the things that you sort of love about Oakland, Berkeley, and the other parts of the East Bay that um, you may inhabit. And so it's, it's really been a pleasure to be friends with Liam for a really long time and to just kind of like work out the idiosyncrasies of like, what, how do you start a podcast and, and really make it work? And I think that, you know, with the, from the first episode of East Bay Yesterday, it was clear that Liam's really nailed it. So in our 25th year, we at Shaping San Francisco have wanted to find a way to celebrate those people that inspire us, um, to bring people into conversation with us. For example, we'll be in conversation with the great Gary Camilla uh, in December, and we'll have Jenny O'Dell, I know she was part of this series, uh, come speak also in November. So we, and some of the, our little you know, local celebrities and people that we have, you know, furtive of email exchanges with like, hey, what about this? And what about that? And did you know about this? And who, have just kept us inspired and engaged along the way. Chris gives boat tours as a result of Liam saying, hey, I'm doing this great thing. I want you to come on the boat and then you can meet the boat people and maybe you wanna do it on the South or the San Francisco side of, of the bay. So 
Um, there is this little, we're kind of like mushrooms, like this little underground mycelial colony that we have and connections and it does really keep us going. And as Chris said, you're actually part of that because there's folks in the room who have joined us on our tours or we know through the, the work that you do. And even if, again, it feels insignificant, I've been talking about this at our tours recently, there's a meme that just went through and said, you know, nobody wants you to go back in time in a time machine because they don't want you to make a small change that will change the world radically. And we don't think that in our, pr our present day lives that if we do one little thing and make a, you know, speak up or do something t uh, out of the ordinary and out of the routine, that will make a difference. So where's the, di where's the dif dissonance there? So I want, as I want to underscore what Chris said, we are active agents of history. So remember that as we're thinking about all those people who are buried at Mountain View Cemetery, and I'm sure we'll hear about some of the lives they led to. So thanks, Liam, for being with us. First of all, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for coming out tonight, and uh, also thank you to uh, everyone at the Oakland Library, especially Emily and Aaron, I think. Where are you? I saw you, Aaron. Oh, there you are. Um, the people who you know run the History Room, it's an incredible resource. If you've never gone up there, it's up on the third floor of this building. Definitely worth checking out. And uh, Chris and Lisa Ruth, definitely the feelings mutual. You guys have been inspiring me for a very long time as well. So it was an honor when you asked me to come up here and talk about Mountain View today, um, although I must admit I was a little intimidated um, because there are so many people who, um, this is actually, next week is my 20th anniversary of moving to the Bay, um, but there's been a lot of people who've lived here a lot longer than I have, who have families that go back generations, who have families who are buried at Mountain View, who have personal connections there, and so um, I, again, you know, was humbled by uh, the, the invitation, but I wanted to really step up and do you guys proud with this presentation. So before I get going, I just wanted to thank all the people who I've learned a lot about Mountain View Cemetery, for, about Mountain View Cemetery from over the years, such as, um, besides the Oakland History Room, where I did much of the research for this uh, talk tonight, um, people like Dennis Evanoski, who's written books about Mountain View Cemetery, uh, Gene Anderson, who does the Oakland Wiki, uh, which is an incredible resource that any of you can contribute to. Um, the Oakland Heritage Alliance, um, they've had countless articles about uh, Mountain View Cemetery in their newsletter over the years, which I recommend subscribing to. And um, also, mostly, uh, actually, Michael Colm Bruno, who uh, has been doing a blog about Mountain View Cemetery for over a decade now. Uh, I interviewed Michael a couple weeks ago, and that interview is going to be coming out on the podcast um, East Bay yesterday in like a day or two. Um, and we do cover a lot of territory that we're not going to cover in the talk today. So even if you're at this talk, if you like to listen to East Bay yesterday, you'll hear all different stories on the podcast. And uh, Michael's um, website, Lives of the Dead, uh, is going to come up a couple times in my talk tonight just because it was such a great resource for uh, gathering the information I'll be discussing. So um, this is a map of Oakland in 1857. Um, let's see, we are right around this area right here. This is Lake Merritt um, before it was dammed off. And um, I'm just putting that up there to set the stage uh, because the first thing I'm going to um, tell you about tonight is a uh, clip from an article that appeared in the Oakland Daily News in April of 1874. And uh, this um, Clipping from the newspaper, which I found upstairs, uh, describes a location that is just a few blocks from us right now. I'm kind of in the vicinity of the Oakland, where the Oakland Museum is now, where Lake Merritt Bard is, because that is where Oakland's um, first official cemetery was located. Okay, so I'm quoting now. In years gone by, the people whose bones lie moldering in the old cemetery at the, lake of, at the head of Lake Peralta, that's how old this article is, it wasn't even named Lake Merritt yet, um, the, people who, the people whose bones lie moldering in the old cemetery at the head of Lake Peralta could have foreseen the desecration, could not have foreseen the desecration that has taken place. If they had, they would have preferred cremation to burial. When Oakland was a little village, the graveyard was located east of Oak Street between 7th and 11th Streets. The site was soon needed, uh, a new site was soon needed, and attractive land in the rear of the university grounds on 12th Street was procured. At that time, the property was remote, and any dwelling house, um, and any dwelling, uh, it was supposed. To, 
basically they're getting to the point that this was supposed to be a permanent cemetery. Okay, I transcribed this and clearly made a couple of a couple errors there. Um, okay. So the bodies that had been interned east of Oak Street were removed to the new cemetery, and for many years, there was no other graveyard in this portion of the county. When Oakland's growth truly began, a new conception of the city's future led to the establishment of the Mountain View Cemetery, located, located in the hills, where it will forever be beyond the encroachments of the living. <laughs> Franklin, Webster, and Harrison streets have been extended through the old cemetery. Crossroads have been opened up and houses have been built in close proximity to each other so that in some places, tombstones can be seen in backyards. Very many bodies have been removed. As the streets were open and graded, many were exhumed, and in two-thirds of these instances, there was nothing indicating the identity of the person whose remains had been disinterred. The man who had been in charge of the old cemetery was unable to read or write and there was no record to show the numbers of the lots or who was buried there. There are still hundreds of graves there, and there is no legal process by which they can be removed. A more revolting and unchristian spectacle cannot be found. <laughs> Ornamental wooden fences have been almost entirely torn down, as if for fuel. Cattle are pastured there. Numerous holes in the ground denote the places from which bodies have been removed. Tombstones lay prostrate. The shrubbery that had been planted by the hands of loving friends is mutilated and trodden underfoot. It is a disgrace to Oakland, and a stranger who might notice it would be excused if he should be uncharitable enough to declare that our people are heathens. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, there are a lot of ways to respond to that description of what happened to Oakland's first cemetery. Uh, one uh, thought that might be popping in your mind right now is, um, did the person you know, in this community, the types of people who would write articles like this bemoaning the state of the cemetery, did they ever consider what happened to the bones of the Ohlone people who existed here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before um, you know, the Europeans and the other colonizers arrived? Um, or you, know, you might scoff at the hubris and short-sighted thinking of think, uh, you know, believing that Mountain View would forever be beyond the encroachment of the living. You know, it's like pattern recognition, right? They've already had to move the cemetery once. It's like, don't you think it's eventually going to happen again? Clearly it did. Um, you know, there's a lot of responses. You could be kind of grossed out at like, these dead bodies being disinterred. Uh, you know, it's a little bit creepy to think about. But this description made me curious above all else because, um, you know, it made me think about Mountain View as a solution to a problem. This was the goal, right, to, to come up with a permanent cemetery. And so when I was approaching this topic, I was thinking about how has this solution worked out? And, you know, what does that even mean? Uh, what is the purpose of a cemetery? Um, so before I get to, you know, abstract or philosophical, I'm going to get um, just introduce some of the uh, things I'm going to be discussing tonight. A uh, quick little overview here. So um, this photo, uh, that last photo was from, or the map was from 1857. This is from 1893, just 36 years later. So it's not like a perfect overlay of the map before, but you can see, hopefully, um, how much Oakland has developed since then. Yeah, if you want to dim the lights up there so it might be a little more visible, but clearly there's been a lot of development in that single generation. So tonight, uh, first I'll be covering sort of the origins uh, and overall history of Mountain View. I'll be talking about some of the most interesting residents, permanent residents there. Uh, I'll be touching briefly on some of the symbolism you'll see on the, the tombstones and grave sites there. Uh, I've been a frequent walker of Mountain View Cemetery for many years, so I'm going to reflect on some personal observations. And then finally, we'll be opening it up for not only Q&A, but also, um, I'd like to hear if anyone has comments or their own stories to share as well, because I'm sure that there are people in this room who um, have their own personal connections uh, to Mountain View, and if there's something that you want to um, let people know about, uh, the floor will be here shortly. So, um, getting to the origins of Mountain View. All right. On the right, that is Frederick Law Olmsted, and on the left, that is his initial sketch for what would become Mountain View Cemetery. 
Uh, people have been burying their dead since before history was recorded, um, but cemeteries like Mountain View, you know, these kind of big open park-like spaces weren't really common before the 1800s. Uh, in the U.S., most graveyards would have been uh, attached to churches, like if anyone's ever been to the little graveyard behind Mission Dolores uh, in San Francisco, they'll give you an idea of kind of these little church graveyards, or, um, you know, back then when a lot of people were farmers or had ranches, there would be a family plot on the, on the property. But uh, starting in the you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, due to growing urbanization, population growth, um, cemeteries, you know, graveyards required a different paradigm. And there was a cultural trend towards like, romanticism at the time and appreciation for nature. You know, as industrialization is happening, people realize nature is something to be you know, valued and um, taken care of and loved, not just uh, scared of and, and tamed and conquered. Um, so all this sort of contributed to what uh, some people call the rural cemetery movement, um, which started off in uh, East Coast cities like Boston, Philadelphia, New York, um, around this time. And in this conception of cemeteries, they were sanctuaries, basically places for you know, peaceful reflection, places to commune with nature, um, tranquility. Uh, and the uh, founding fathers, or some of the founding fathers of Oakland, people like Samuel Merritt, uh, who of course Lake Merritt is named after, uh, decided once they took a look at the um, you know, state of the cemetery that was just a few blocks from here uh, in the early 1860s that Oakland would need a better solution. And so they had a meeting, uh, I believe it was at Merritt's house in 1864, and they drew up this idea to create Mountain View Cemetery. Um, Fortunately, Frederick Law Olmsted was available at the time. He, uh, a lot of you probably are familiar with that name. He's commonly referred to as the, um, you know, like the father, or godfather of American landscape architecture. He's most famous for uh, designing Central Park in New York. Um, but in the early 1860s, he was working for a gold mining company uh, out in um, Bear Valley, and that gold mining company went bankrupt. So Olmsted was out of a job. He was in town, and the, um, you know, the people who were uh, putting Mountain View, putting this plan together, reached out to him, and he jumped at the opportunity. This is one of his first uh, big projects. So, um, let's see. Uh, his inspiration for this was that in 1850, Frederick Law Olmsted had traveled to England, um, where he was influenced by the Romantic Gardens that the English designed as a revolt against the formal French tradition of geometric and artificial landscapes. So, you know, if you think about those famous, you know, gardens at Versailles and things like that, where everything is like straight lines, very even, you know, uh, sharp uh, edges, the English trend at the time was to have more kind of like curves, uh, follow the landscape, and that was really um, the school of thought that Olmsted adopted and that he employed when he was designing Mountain View Cemetery. Um, as you can see here, oh wait, hold on, let's see, what am I going to say? Oh yeah, the uh, cemetery, it's amazing how fast this plan actually took route, route. Um, their first meeting was in 1864. The cemetery opened one year later, um, on May 25th, 1865. Um, just to kind of put it in context, this is right after the Civil War ended. It's like about six weeks after the Civil War ended. And uh, the, route, the road that led up to Mountain View Cemetery uh, was named Cemetery Road. Of course, it was later renamed Piedmont Avenue. Um, I'm guessing that was probably the business people along the road wanted something a little bit more appetizing. <laughs> I don't know. That's just speculation. But uh, it's, it's really amazing. I'm going to put the side-by-side um, -side comparison here just real quick. So on the left is Olmsted's sketch from the 1860s. And on the right, this is the most recent uh, map that you can find on the Mountain View website. And um, you can see uh, how you know, they've really stayed true to his vision for the most part. Um, and also, again, you can see how these winding paths really hug the contours of the, uh, of the hills and valleys that uh, this land was, um, like the, you know, he was working with what he had on the land, not trying to reshape everything, which I think was a, a brilliant idea. Um, so, on the 150th anniversary of Mountain View Cemetery, which was in 2015, uh, SF Gate ran a article in honor of the 150th anniversary. And I'm just going to read the first line from that article right now because it's just a brilliant little nugget of journalism. <laughs> Quote, there are 177,000 people at historic Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland, many of them famous, all of them dead. <laughs> 
I wish my editor would let me get away with stuff like that. Maybe <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes she does. I love my editor. I'm just... All right. So in addition to the um, incredible you know, landscape of Mountain View Cemetery, another thing that really draws people are structures like this, the grand you know, mausoleums, these um, ornate resting places. Uh, you can see them throughout the cemetery. Um, let's see, you know, it, it, depending on the personality of the person who commissioned the piece and the era, you'll see a lot of different styles reflected, Egyptian, neoclassical, um, Gothic, neo-Gothic, etc. And even, um, you know, I was thinking about this, like, none of these buildings are more than 150 years old, or, you know, give or take, but, um, you know, we don't really have a lot of ancient buildings in the United States or places like Oakland. Oakland was just established as a city, you know, less than 200 years ago. So, um, in some ways, kind of going to Mountain View and strolling around the grounds is like the closest you can get uh, on a budget to, you know, going to Europe and seeing the great cathedrals and the great, you know, castles and things like that because th there was, uh, you know, the people who designed these mausoleums were very uh, clearly influenced by those uh, classical European styles and, and the different revivals as well. Um, oh, I wanted to mention also that to show their uh, loyalty to Mountain View Cemetery, you know, the people, the founders, the people who um, came up with the plan to establish it, uh, they committed themselves to burying themselves and their families there. So you'll see uh, Merritt and a lot of the other founders um, spread out throughout Mountain View Cemetery. Um, another major monument that you'll see is this one. Uh, just in case you didn't uh, get the uh, June 1991 issue of Stone Magazine, <laughs> which is exactly what it sounds like. I'll give you a little context for this. Um, hey, our local cemetery is the cover story in Stone Magazine. It's pretty big. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, this is the uh, mausoleum of Charles Crocker and his family. He was one of the big four, the robber barons who owned the railroads, you know, uh, who was at Huntington, Stanford, Crocker, and Hopkins. Um, so his uh, fortune was estimated at between 20 and 40 million dollars. He was just insanely rich um, by the time he passed away. Uh, does anyone want to guess how much of that money he gave away to charity or philanthropic causes? Yes, you in the back. The answer, my friend, that's a good guess, but it's even lower. The answer is zero. Big old goose egg. Zero. So he meant this to be a tribute to his greatness, you know, his fortune. And when I look at this, I just think, what a greedy bastard. <laughs> um, there's a lot of hilarious stories behind some of the, these incredible monuments there. Uh, there's a seven, the tallest monument at Mountain View was... Uh, um, put there in honor of Henry David Cogswell. It's a 70-foot tall obelisk. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with it. It kind of is like a little bit reminiscent of uh, the Washington Monument, a little bit, you know, obelisk. Um, and he, Cogswell, was a dentist, but he made his uh, real fortune uh, in land speculation. And uh, he was a supporter of the temperance movement. And as a supporter of the temperance movement, he installed public water fountains across the country to keep the thirsty out of saloons. His thought was that people would need to drink that nasty whiskey if they could just get some cold, refreshing H2O. Um, somewhat unmodestly, these fountains were crowned with larger-than-life statues of Cogswell, a temperance pledge in one hand and a goblet of, uh, you know, presumably water <laughs> in the other. Let's see, what's the next slide? Oh yeah, um, people hated these statues. Um, they revolted, actually. Uh, Cogswell's temperance statue uh, that he put up in Washington, D.C. was called, quote, the city's ugliest statue. It was so ugly, people hated it so much that this inspired uh, like city councils to start passing laws about who could put up statues and where. This was the beginning of like public review processes for uh, public art installations. Um, his statue in San Francisco was torn down. This is actually an illustration from the, I believe, 1874 edition of the San Francisco Morning Call. So this was a newspaper illustration depicting uh, old Cogswell's <laughs> monument. Um, but even this 
isn't uh, as bad as it got. People actually relocated one of his statues in Connecticut to the bottom of a lake. <laughs> so not even any rubble left from that one. But something I noticed as I was uh, you know, going through this history and uh, exploring all these mausoleums is that that was a trend that kind of died out. You know, building these grand uh, kind of like statuesque monuments to yourself, it was kind of like a robber baron, you know, thing. So this is the uh, mausoleum for Henry J. Kaiser, who of course was like, you know, this sort of next generation or a couple generations later of the great industrialists of California. And he is uh, interned at Mountain View, but he does not have a you know, 70 foot tall obelisk or anything like that. It's a relatively modest, um, although very classy, uh, <laughs> um, marble um, box here. Um, and I think that the, um, you know, the elite realized that if they wanted to kind of feed their egos and have their names live on, that the best way to do that would be um, you know, having a hospital named after yourself, having a museum named after yourself, giving your fortune to some kind of uh, enterprise that people would utilize so they would have to say your name all the time. <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, like who remembers Cogswell, right? I mean, everyone knows that that, mausole or that monument is there when they walk into Mountain View Cemetery, but I think very few people know that um, he was the creator of some of the most hated statues in American history. <laughs> Uh, another um, monument that I've always appreciated is this one. Uh, this is the Elk statue, of course, uh, the Elk's Columbarium, technically. And um, this is a section of the cemetery where you'll see the Benevolent Protective Order of the Elk's Club and their families buried. Um, I was interested to learn that this uh, statue was actually modeled after a real elk that had been uh, basically relocated from the wilds to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. His name was Father Elk. And uh, the sculptor modeled this, uh, this masterpiece after Father Elk. Um, but the, the fascinating thing was like, I went through so many different you know, rabbit holes as I was researching this uh, topic. And every rabbit hole, you just find like something that's like crazy. Like for example, I had no idea that like I'd heard of the Elks Club, but I didn't really know that much about who they were or what they did. I figured it was one of those kind of old school, you know, benevolent societies that does like charity work and yada yada. Apparently, and you will not see this on the official Elks Club website, <laughs> but it, and this is also a little offensive. I should warn you. Apparently, they were first organized um, as a club for minstrel show performers, um, which. Uh, they're not anymore, thankfully. I think they got moved on from that period a long time ago. But again, like you, you know, pick any gravestone, pick any monument in the cemetery, start digging, and you will find something that's probably shocking or unusual. It's just really um, there's a story behind every single one of these monuments. So, one of the most iconic parts of Mountain View Cemetery is Millionaire's Row here, as it is uh, fondly known. Um, some of the founders are buried here. And uh, I, I should mention, uh, not all the photos I'm using in this presentation are mine. I don't want to take credit for anyone else's work. Some of the photos are mine. This is not one of mine. Um, but let's see. Uh, one of the things, another kind of like trend, because you know you could go down on these rabbit holes, but also I was looking for some sort of big picture um, things that we can learn from studying the history of Mountain View Cemetery. One of the things I noticed was that so many of these guys, like the people, a lot of the people who are buried here at Millionaire's Row, came to California with nothing. I mean, there was story after story of people who were, you know, teenage runaways. A 13-year-old jumps on a ship in Boston or whatever, sails to California, you know, wearing rags and nothing else. And then within three decades, he's the governor of California or owns like one-seventh of the state. Um, those are both real examples, by the way. Um, and you just kind of see this trajectory again and again, and it kind of gives you a sense of, um, the origins of this kind of California dream narrative. I mean, we're all familiar with this concept of the gold rush, but like when you see it um, like at the individual level and all these people who actually lived that dream, who actually, you know, whether or not they actually found gold, came to California and for them it really was a, a promised land. And some of them lost those fortunes that they made. Um, there was a lot of gambling back then too. And whiskey, as uh, Cogswell was well aware. But um, a lot of them held on to their fortunes. And um, some of that wealth has you know, been passed down generation to generation. And still you know, present here in our modern society. Um, and you know, like, 
the realization of like you know all these kind of people who uh embodied the sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality like living this uh pioneers or some would say colonist stream um you know these i don't think there's any like easy takeaways from these stories a lot of the time the things that you'll be made aware of when you study a place like mountain view cemetery um because there's so much time to walk around and wander, aren't that there's answers to these questions. It's just something to kind of mull over and consider, does the California dream still exist? You know, is this still a trajectory that's drawing people here? Um, you know, I think this legend still lives on. You know, people like, uh, I don't know, like Elon Musk, for example, want you to believe that they came to Silicon Valley with nothing but rags and made their vast fortunes just by the, you know, um, grit and determination and pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. But again, it does always help when you're, um, uh, grandparents own an emerald mine in like an apartheid country, right? So <laughs> not all those examples of, uh, you know, the people who followed in this tradition of rugged individualism, uh, I think stand up to scrutiny once we interrogate them. Um, let's see here. So, yeah, I mean, the, the cool thing about Mountain View is that as a topic, you can learn like everything about not only Oakland, but California history or so much about you know, our state's history, our local history, just by, um, you know, looking at the people who are buried there. Uh, the names, just like the names, like if you've ever thought about who was Lake Merritt named after, what about Adams Point, um, Shattuck Avenue, uh, Lake Chabot, Emeryville, uh, Ashby, o o Frank Ogawa of Ogawa Plaza, um, Trader Vic. These people, all these names that a lot of us are probably familiar with, you can find their stories um, at Mountain View Cemetery. Um, there were, you know, the people who literally built Oakland, like bricklayers, <laughs> the Remillard family, you know, people who, who built our city, our town, our state, um, are buried here, and you can learn about the history of, you know, how this place developed through these life stories. And, uh, you know, it's not just the millionaires. It's not just the rich people. You will find people from every race, every ethnicity, you know, there's different sections of the uh, cemetery for um, Chinese immigrants, African Americans, Civil War veterans, um, and people who list like literally listed their profession on their you know official documents as capitalist. They weren't like, oh, I own a factory. They're like, I'm a capitalist. And then on the other end of the spectrum, people who were leading members of the the Wobblies, the IWW, the most like radical, one of the most radical organizations you know of the 20th century. So um, it really spans the, um, the gamut. And just to kind of make that uh, point even further, I'm just going to mention briefly the story of the, the stranger's plot, the stranger's burial ground. Um, you can see the uh, quote here um, from the uh, San Francisco Chronicle article of a couple years ago. Again, this is another uh, document that I found up in the files of the Oakland History Center. And so... The um, strangers plot, you know, as you can probably imagine, they were the people who couldn't afford uh, not only great mausoleums, but even a casket, even a tombstone. So they were basically put in this one corner of the cemetery. But the interesting thing um, to consider is that the millionaires up in Millionaires Row would not have been millionaires if it wasn't for the strangers buried down in the strangers plot. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, and I, I should give a little credit to my friend um, Jenny O'Dell, who writes about The Stranger's Plot in her new book, uh, Saving Time. Um, and in that book, she describes how a lot of the people who are buried here, it's unclear. Um, some estimates say dozens, some say even more. Um, a lot of the people buried here were Chinese laborers, uh, specifically people who died in dynamite explosions when they were building the roads and the transportation networks and the buildings that made the fortunes of the millionaires possible. So when you, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about a place like Mountain View, you can just make all these really interesting connections. Like for example, another connection that just kind of dawned on me as, as I was studying all the people who were buried there is, um, this is the uh, announcement about uh, how the Panthers were getting together funding to put a memorial in Mountain View to honor little Bobby Hutton who was one of the first members of the Black Panther Party. He was murdered by the Oakland police about a mile or two 
uh, west of here uh, in the vicinity of Defermery Park. And so in honor of uh, Bobby Hutton, a lot of people refer to Defermery Park or a portion of the park, the, the part with the trees, the grove, as Little Bobby Hutton Park or Little Bobby Hutton Memorial Grove. And the connection is that not only is Bobby Hutton buried at Mountain View, but so is Defermery, the Defermery family. And again, like, I don't, you know, I think that some of these connections are just things that you can ponder and think about as you're walking through. I think the cemetery and Olmsted's design really lends itself to, you know, thinking about these things. What does it mean to you? Um, and you'll notice, like, again, trends as you walk through. Uh, if you look at a lot of older tombstones, you'll realize how young most people died back then. Uh, you'll see so many tombstones of people who died in their 20s, 30s, 40s, let alone, you know, children. The infant mortality rate was, you know, sky high back then. Um, you will see huge families. It's not uncommon when you're reading the biographies of these people who were buried at Mountain View to hear about how they came from families of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 kids. Um, and also another thing you'll notice uh, if you study some of the biographies that uh, Michael Colm Bruno has written about on his... Uh, Lives of the Dead blog is that people who were professional race car drivers did not tend to live very long. Um, it's just like race car driver. He had a great career for one year and then buried a Mountain View. Um, kind of makes you wonder why people would keep doing that. Uh, but let's see. Wandering around the cemetery is really fun. Um, great way to you know enjoy nature and see some great sunsets. But a lot of the times over the years when I've gone to Mountain View, it has been specifically to seek out certain graves, like this one, uh, Fred Korematsu. He's the first uh, Asian American to have a state holiday named after him. He famously resisted the uh, internment, or some would say mass incarceration, of Japanese Americans during World War II. And as you can see, People to this day um, still come to his grave to honor him, put, putting these little signs and trinkets and things like that up there. Um, and I just wanted to mention that if you want to know more about some of these people, uh, a lot of uh, the people who are buried at Mountain View have done full episodes of East Bay yesterday about. So there's a whole hour on Fred Korematsu that you can find. Also, a few other people uh, who I've covered extensively on the podcast who are buried there are. My very first episode was about Ina Coolbrith, who was Oakland's first librarian and California's first poet laureate. You can find her grave there. Uh, William Shorey, uh, who was the only, as far as we know, the only black whaling captain in um, American history. Uh, Borax Smith, who uh, was one of the key people behind the, the key system, which was the transportation network of uh, streetcars and ferries before BART and AC Transit and the bridges were developed. Uh, the famous architect Julia Morgan, uh, Byron Rumford, who passed uh, some really or helped pass some really important anti-discrimination legislation as the first black uh, legislator from Northern California in Sacramento, and also Lou Hing, who had just has an insane story. He was a pioneering uh, Chinese industrialist in Oakland. He had this huge canning factory after the 1906 earthquake when the um, Chinese people were being turned away from other shelters, refugee camps. He brought them into his property and gave people jobs and helped really saved probably a lot of lives. Um, so, um, you know, if you're listening to an episode of East Bay yesterday, a lot of the time I like to listen to podcasts when I'm walking. You know, you can put it on, walk around the cemetery, find these graves. And I feel like when I'm researching these people and studying them, seeing their grave makes their lives feel even more real. You know, it's just such a um, visceral connection. This isn't just a name on a screen or in a book. You're you know, you can put your fingers on the letters. You know, you can feel the, you know, the permanence of what they accomplished when you look at an uh, impressive tombstone like that. Um, oh, one other person I did an episode about who I want to give a shout out to, who's buried in Mountain View, Mac Dre, of course. Um, some would say the inventor of hyphae, originator of the fizzle dance. Uh, his funeral at Mountain View almost resulted in a riot because so many people showed up and there was only room for about 100 or 200 people in the chapel. Um, but he was buried. Unfortunately, his tombstone was stolen by, I don't know, I assume some overzealous fans back in 2006. It's been replaced, but the family does not want people to know where it is. So some people do know, but this is one of those tombstones that's a little bit harder to track down if you're trying to um, go pay your tribute to Mac Dre. Um, 
I just want to run through. Oh, actually, wait, sorry. Um, uh, what am I doing here? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about this one. I think I've mixed the order up of these two, but um, actually, you know what? I mean, I'm going to do that. Okay. So here's another aerial view of Mountain, Cemet Mountain View Cemetery. Oh. I was thinking about timing. You know what? All right, I do have to mention one more person. I'm going to skip a couple of these, but uh, <laughs> again, like the, the parallels you see between the people that are buried at Mountain View and modern situations, modern personalities is really astonishing sometimes. Um, for example, there was this guy named Johnny Skay, and again, this is someone I learned about from Michael's blog, but uh, he was basically the first like tech bro scam artist. Um, and you'll know exactly what I mean in a second. So basically, he worked for the telegraph company, and he essentially hacked the system so he was intercepting telegraph messages so he could do insider trading on California stock market. And it was very successful for a little while. He made millions of dollars in true tech bro fashion, squandered it fabulously. He um, would like get like steak to use as bait and have uh, his ponds on his property stocked with trout and people go fishing for trout. And it was just lavish. You know, he's importing wines from Europe and throwing money around willy nilly. Um, Mark Twain wrote about him. Mark Twain was very impressed with this character. Um, I know you'll be shocked to hear this, but uh, his fortunes did come crumbling down rather rapidly. Um, he like missed a, missed a trade, lost the fortune, uh, was broke and destitute uh, within a couple years of you know, a spectacular rise and fall. And the, it was funny because reading the Mark Twain thing reminded me of uh, how like Michael Lewis, the famous local Berkeley author, had embedded himself with uh, SBF, Sam Bankman Freed, the crypto bro who last year was worth $36 billion and now is worth nothing and is facing tons of prison time for like one of the biggest frauds in the history of America. Um, you know, like these stories, like you see these kind of archetypes, these characters repeating over and over again. It's just funny to think about. Um, maybe if SBF had known about Johnny Skay, <laughs> he uh, could have avoided this calamitous destiny, but probably not. Um, okay, I want to mention one other person um, before I kind of switch gears into the next section of the talk. And uh, this is a person named Annie Glud. And her claim to fame, uh, maybe I should say their claim to fame, um, was that they were the drummer boy for Ulysses S. Grant during several major Civil War battles, including Gettysburg. The story is that um, uh, Annie's father brought her you know, to the battle because there was no one, like her mom died and there was no one to take care of her, dressed her up, you know, she dressed up as a boy, uh, and then she was going to get kicked out for being too young, but apparently U Ulysses S. Grant was like, I like the you know the look of this kid. They can be my drummer boy, and so she would go along with Ulysses S. Grant during these battles, um, playing you know the drum, doing what drummer boys be doing. Um, <laughs> but and oh, and, and no one knew she was a girl. They were a girl. This was all very you know hush hush. Um, Glud didn't reveal the secret until much later in her uh, life when they were living in Oakland. And the interesting thing, or one of the lessons from this story, is that you should always be skeptical about things you read on the internet. Because the story that I just told you may or may not be true. Um, it was reported in many newspapers. Um, it was, you know, she told the story to a reporter and people loved it and they ate it up and it was covered, you know, national media, people just keep repeating the story. But um, in later years, later decades, people from the family supposedly came forward and said, this is a farce, none of this ever happened. So there, there's some debate, you know, I don't think we'll ever probably know the true answer. Um, there's some evidence for, some evidence against, but again, um, you know, I see this time and time again where I'll see, uh, I'll read a fact and then, you know, I'll go to the history room and I'll be like, okay, it was in this article and this article and this article and I'll try to find the first article this thing was mentioned and it's be like, okay, how did that person, you know, like when you go down the, the, the trail of breadcrumbs, sometimes the, the, tr the trail just peters out and there's never a way of knowing if the story that's been reported so many times by so many reporters was just something to drum up readership or something that actually happened or maybe a mix of, you know, truth and legend, which I think is often the case. So I want to talk briefly about symbolism. 
at Mountain View um, because you know this is something fascinating. Uh, these a lot of these things that you see at Mountain View aren't just for decoration. Uh, they're supposed to have a meaningful. Uh, you know, they're communicating something. And so angels are one example of that. And it is not simple to explain what angels symbolize, depending on if they're pointing. They, that can mean they're pointing up to heaven, or it can mean something else. If they're resting, if they have wings or not. Um, there's all kinds of symbolism behind the various angels. Um, some people think of them as, if they have wings, that means they're messengers to heaven to guide the soul of the um, departed. And uh, again, just giving a shout out to some of the people that have compiled a lot of the information that I'm sharing tonight. Uh, if you want to know more about some of the symbolism in Mountain View, uh, Dennis Evanoski has a great video on YouTube that you can find from a tour he gave on site a couple years ago. But I will share a few more bits about some of the common symbols you'll see out there. And again, just giving credit to uh, Michael's blog. This is, uh, I'll read it out loud since some of you guys in back, it's probably pretty small. But uh, the symbol here I'm talking about is the hand shaking. Um, when you see two hands shaking with the cuffs of different genders, this symbolizes marriage. This grave is, the east, is to the east of the Victorian vaults in plot two under the angel. It marks the resting place of a husband and wife. If you see a similar marker, but with gender neutral cuffs, it can symbolize a heavenly welcome or an earthly farewell. This is a fairly common gravestone symbol. And the first thing I thought of when I saw this symbol, these handshaking before I you know, read the accompanying article, was just that it reminded me of the emojis of the handshaking that we all have on our smartphones. And that just is a good reminder that the reason why these emojis are so instantly recognizable is because they're based on these ancient archetypes that people have been using to communicate um, you know, visually for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, a couple other quick symbols I'll mention are, um, you'll see weeping willows on a few tombstones at Mountain View. Uh, they can symbolize grief and sorrow, but also in Christianity, it can suggest uh, immortality or the longevity of the Gospels. Uh, the thought being that if you cut branches from weeping willows, even if you cut a lot of branches, it'll grow back, so it'll keep regenerating. Um, I suppose like the, like the Gospels of Christ spreading throughout the world. Um, this one is probably not going to be a shocker if you see a cross, uh, like a pick, like a mining pick and a shovel. That means the person is probably a miner, a gold miner. Um, lambs are often something you'll see on children's graves, uh, symbolizing innocence. And one other tombstone that I want to give some, just a quick little shout out to here is this one. The tombstone of Otis H. Painter. He was a store clerk who passed away in, uh, what was this, 1935. And I, I like to give this one a shout out because it's Michael's favorite tombstone and it's, I, I feel like he's kind of winning me over with it. And you might not be able to kind of get a, a good look at Mr. Painter, so I'll, I'll give you the close up here. Um, <laughs> I wish I, I should have lightened this up a little bit, but it's like the jauntiest photo. And um, tragically, Mr. Painter was uh, killed by thieves who uh, fractured his skull on Broadway in downtown Oakland when he was leaving work. However, he left behind this very dapper photograph on his tombstone. Uh, he's got these giant, like this giant butterfly collar. He's got a pipe, you know, the fedora kind of tucked rakishly onto his head and just such a winning smile. So, you know, even though he died um, this very unfortunate death, I think he like lives on uh, in this tomb and <laughs> inspires probably some happy thoughts in a lot of the people who pass by and just see this, you know, chipper young guy with his um, pipe poking out of his mouth. Um, so switching gears, I just want to read one other quote that I found upstairs. And this one comes from a uh, college paper, I think it was like a thesis that was written by uh, Gail Lenahan, who went on to become a docent in Mountain View. And uh, while she was a student, or taking classes at Holy Names University in the Oakland Hills. Uh, she wrote this in 1986 in her paper about Mountain View. The cemetery continues to mirror the society around it, continues to collect new cultural artifacts, which neglect dilapidation and vandalism erode, oh, I'm sorry, while neglect, dilapidation, and vandalism erode the old. In older areas of the cemetery, there are high weeds, crumbling walks, and smashed and broken monuments that would dismay Olmstead. 
but many Victorians found, de- found decay, dilapidation, and ruins romantic, the perfect setting for a Gothic novel and the antithesis of the well-manicured parks of today. Perhaps the Victorian spirit lingers on and is satisfied with things as they are in Mountain View. And since um, we brought up Olmsted there, I want to address um, kind of one of the conflicts around Mountain View Cemetery, which is the conversation around, you know, this has been utilized essentially as a public space by many Oaklanders, including myself, including many of you, I'm sure, for many years, but it's not a public space. It's a privately owned cemetery. And um, those, you know, this, that status has resulted in, in some, some problems over the years. Um, getting back to Olmsted, he uh, thought that um, he didn't want cemeteries like Mountain View to become, quote, pleasure grounds with burials attached to them, but a place to manifest dignity to the dead. He wanted a place for peace and tranquility, and uh, Olmsted wrote that he was dismayed when he saw people playing baseball or having horse races in his cemeteries. Now, I've never seen anyone racing horses <laughs> at Mountain View, uh, but I have seen some pretty bad behavior over the years. Uh, probably the weirdest thing I saw was um, a couple years ago, I was hiking up towards like the top where there used to be a, kind of like a forested area up there, and it was early. It was like 10 o'clock on like a Saturday or Sunday morning, and there was a group of what looked like college kids playing beer pong. Like, they'd brought up a whole table and, like, all the cups, and, like, they had, like, cases of beer. They all looked like they were, like, 18 or 19, and they were playing beer pong up there. I was like, okay, you guys do you. Um, Let's see. There was, you know, there's been a lot of vandalism, and I'm not talking about, like, painting the old sheds and things like that. I mean, vandalism of the actual tombstones and graves. There's been, uh, you know, people knocking graves down on purpose. There's been grave robberies, unfortunately, which has uh, been kind of a grotesque reoccurring thing that's happened a few times over the years, and um, theft as well. For example, there was cannonballs, a lot of cannonballs donated to Mountain View Cemetery in 1897 as part of the Civil War Memorial section. All those cannonballs disappeared. So um, I think the most common uh, problem that the people who are visiting their relatives at Mountain View complain about or that the management complains about when they're explaining to people uh, why they're sort of restricting uh, public access is dog poop on the graves. Um, that's, you know, pretty disrespectful, I think. I, 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 in my personal opinion, I love Mountain View. I love to go walking there. I think it should be open and accessible to the public. But again, there needs to be some balance. So if you do go to Mountain View, don't let your dog poop all over someone's grave. And if it does, please pick it up. Um, so this is like an ongoing question. Uh, the Cemetery used to be open, I think, seven days a week with pretty good hours. But then during the pandemic, they shut it down basically completely, um, except for uh, family visitors. I think even family visitors were barred for a little bit at the very beginning of the pandemic. Now it's open three days a week, um, and it closes earlier than it used to. And the bummer about that is one of the best times to be at Mountain View is during the sunset. So sometimes when it closes, I think, was it closed at like five? Something like five. So you miss the sunset during the summer, which is a bummer. Um, but let's see. One of the uh, reasons why I think it's such a exciting and rewarding place to walk around, take a stroll, is not only for the thoughts that it inspires, but also because it's never the same place twice. You never know what you're going to see out here. Sometimes you'll see a you know a Santa hat on one of these really really old graves, and I'm like, do they know this person? Was this just <laughs> decoration. Um, depending on the time of year you go, depending on the time of day, depending on the weather, it can really evoke different different kind of vibes. Uh, and sometimes there's major changes. Uh, there's been some real big uh, reshaping of Mountain View over the last couple of years uh, in order to expand the parts of the grounds that are open for burials, open for plots. Uh, a lot of things were knocked down. They ripped out some boulders. Uh, which uh, Andrew Alden, my friend, who's the Oakland geologist, was very sad about. Uh, They cut down some trees, and they uh, ripped down these old uh, storage sheds that used to be up at one of the best lookout points, which is, uh, I don't know, a little bit of a bummer, too. But, you know, things change. And um, I just want to, before moving on to the Q&A and comment section, uh, give one more plug to the people who provide free docent tours at Mountain View Cemetery. If you're interested, 
Uh, you can look on their website. Uh, I think they're on like every other Saturday. Um, but there's different themes depending on what you're interested in. You can learn about Civil War history, women's history. Um, this uh, photo represents uh, the Black History Tour. This is William Shorey, that, um, that whaling captain that I mentioned earlier. Michael Colbruno, who runs the Lives of the Dead blog, is actually working on developing an opera about this guy right now. So that could be very interesting. I, again, I did a whole episode about him if you want to know his story, but it's wild. It's a crazy story. And there's a lot of other um, really um, pioneers of kind of this early civil rights movement buried there too, like Oakland's first black school teacher. Um, Michael's working on a sports history tour. And apparently, this probably will not come as a shock to you, the most popular tour that they do at Mountain View Cemetery is the one that's titled Naughty and Notorious. <laughs> So that's the, that's the zesty tour for, for those of you who like it spicy. Okay, so I'm going to open it up in a second for Q&A. And um, for that, uh, people will need to come up and speak into this microphone. So if you know, people want to kind of form a line, um, you can do that or just come up when the next person leaves. Uh, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, before starting the Q&A, I just want to give one more plug for... Um, uh, my newsletter, actually, I only send it out once a month, uh, and I not only uh, let you know about events like this and other things that I'm working on, uh, like I'm doing an event in Berkeley at Shotgun Players Theater in December, but I keep you up to date on things that lots of other local historians are doing, things like the Shaping SF calendar, I always link to you guys, Chris and Lisa Ruth, whenever you put out your new calendar, and there's just so, like you said, it's like mushrooms, there's so many people doing um, local history projects, so many journalists writing about local history, it's really incredible, so I'd like to spread the word about that in the newsletter, and on social media, the Mountain View episode of the podcast is coming out in a day or two. And, um, oh yeah, you're probably wondering what we're looking at right now. I just wanted to have a nice pretty picture up while we're doing the Q&A. So I chose this one. It's a painting by William Keith, who, again, is someone buried at Mountain View Cemetery, very famous, uh, primarily landscape painter. And does anyone want to guess what intersection of Oakland he painted this at? Anyone want to guess? This was painted, just to give you a hint, back in 18... 67, and it depicts the Southern Pacific Railroad Depot. It doesn't look like this anymore, but this is 7th and Adeline. 7th and Adeline. Just astonishing to think about how much, how drastically that landscape has changed in the, in the 150 years since uh, William Keith painted that. So, all right, let's open it up to uh, Q&A, and thank you for uh, laughing at my jokes. And again, if people have stories they want to share as well, we've got uh, about 10 minutes or so before we have to start winding it down. Just to, so. Questions? Yeah, Aaron, come on down. Great. Thank you, Liam. Hey, everyone. I'm Aaron. I also work in the Oakland History Center. And I just wanted to plug that the same Sunday that Shaping SF is doing a cemetery bike ride, so are we. <laughs> so we're going to be uh, riding to Mountain View Cemetery this Sunday, the 29th, at 10 AM. We're going to meet in front of the main library and uh, take a mellow three-mile ride up to Mountain View with a couple of stops to talk about some uh, random history. Like, yeah, I can't thanks. wait for that. Oh, you can come to ours after. Ours is that new. <laughs> <laughs> Ride the cart. The uh, classic bicycle cemetery tour double header. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. It might not be related very much to cemeteries, but I used to work, my first job in Oakland was working at the Claremont Country Club, uh -huh. which is adjacent yeah. to it. And mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time having to jump the fence and go into the cemetery to fetch golf balls from oh. hackers who were the wealthiest people in the Bay Area who couldn't play golf. Yeah. Uh, but I just wonder, in the research that you did on the history of the land, around Mountain View, if you encountered anything about the acquisition and segregation of Claremont Country Club and, and its evolution alongside the cemetery? That's a good question. I don't really know that much about the history of Claremont Country Club or how they acquired that land. If anyone else does, feel free to jump up and answer Chris's question because uh, this is another reason why I love doing these events. I'm like adding that to my list of uh, 
things to look into. And uh, we do share that in common as well, Chris. I was also a caddy uh, for many years as a, as a youngster. That's what did it to us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Yeah, come on up. Um, this is a great talk. Thank, Thank you. So much. you. Um, I work at the Cal Academy of Sciences nice. in SF. Yeah. Um, and I saw your talk about the key system, which was really, really incredible. If you haven't heard that episode, I highly recommend it. Um, but I spent a year working in our library archives last year with um, high school students interning for me, and we did a project called Untold Stories from the Archives, if you're familiar. Um, that project, the aim of that project was to like highlight marginalized scientists who have contributed to the Academy's history, whose stories haven't been told until now. And I just wanted to point out one person who's, her name is Sarah Allen Lemon, Sarah Allen Plummer Lemon. Um, she's from the East Coast originally and came to California for her health. She met uh, her husband, John Jill Lemon, in Santa Barbara, they moved up here to Oakland, and they like botanized, or they discovered three percent of Ari three percent of all of Arizona's plants, um, and this was like in the 1850s. So they were like taking trains and horses and just you know doing all of these like wild things. We think about like the transportation then, the clothing then. You know, she's doing all of this botanizing, climbing mountains in like a probably a very heavy dress. Um, and she's responsible for the golden poppy being our state flower. She lobbied the government for 10 years. And so like, I just like to say, whenever you see a poppy, think of Sarah and all the work that she did. And she and her husband are buried at Mountain View Cemetery um, in plot 46. I haven't found them yet. I haven't gone to look for them, but I highly suggest that you all do. Um, there's a poppy on their gravestone. And they also lived on Telegraph Avenue, that house with like the windmill outside. Oh. Yeah. So that was their house. <laughs> we all know it. That was their home. They lived there for many years. They, um, they owned that home towards the end of their life. But that's where they stored their personal herbarium, too. So um, if you go to our website, calacademy.org, and search Untold Stories, you can read the profile that my student wrote about her. And it's very well done and very well researched. And you can read about all the other scientists too. Thank you. Yeah, point. definitely check that out. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, you didn't touch on this, and I don't know if this is a teaser for your episode or anything, but um, can you tell us a little bit about the relationship to Jonestown of Mountain View Cemetery? Oh yeah. Well, it's actually um, the people who were who died in the Jonestown tragedy uh, are actually buried at Evergreen Cemetery, not Mountain View. So it's the other one of the other big cemeteries in Oakland, in the East Oakland Hills. So yeah, that's a whole other story. The I think the 50th anniversary of Jonestown is coming up very soon, like next month, so I'm sure that'll be in the news again. But uh, yeah, that's another great cemetery. Um, a lot of interesting sections there. There's a section for Hell's Angels as well uh, in Evergreen, so uh, that's that's another um, piece of Oakland. The Oakland Hills is worth taking, taking a wander around. Yeah. So that was gonna be my question, and I couldn't figure out how to ask without sounding like, Mountain View's great, but <laughs> are you gonna, Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't have it on the books right now. I've got a list of topics that keeps growing, growing. But yeah, I'm super fascinated in Evergreen. I want to do something about that. And um, I believe that there's someone doing kind of like a deep dive into the connection between Jonestown and the cemetery and people from Oakland who ended up there. Um, for Oakland side that's going to be coming out closer to the actual anniversary date. So there w that'll be again in the news again very soon. Yeah, definitely. Everybody's the one east of Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, come on up. This is uh, more of a personal anecdote, but I went to uh, CCA. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you know, the Oakland campus is just on the other side. Yeah. So all the, uh, the emo art school kids would hang out in the cemetery oh, yeah. and you know, have their little sketch pads, and I remember my intro to drawing class, we had to go there, and 
you know, like look at perspectives, and some people were doing etchings oh, totally. on, on the tombstones. So a lot of like uh, uh, wonderful memories uh, from my early art school days at cemetery. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, that actually reminds me. There was a story that I was trying to track down, and I talked to the woman on the phone briefly, and I I kept trying to set up an interview with her, and she was she has young kids now, and is in a band, and it just kept falling through. So I didn't get the story recorded, but. Um, maybe when you were out there, you saw this. There used to be this really big group of goths who hung out at Mountain View. Yeah, you're shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about, the goth kids. And, uh, you know, of course, appropriate place for gothic people to hang out in. Um, but apparently there was like a split in the goth community. Oh, you're sh so you know this story too. Okay, so here's what I heard. Correct me if I get anything wrong. I love these guys. Oh, you're like... Is this, am I making you uncomfortable? Is it okay to reveal this? Basically, like, you're like, you're, I can tell, you tell you're tensing up. All right, I'll, 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 keep, it, I'll keep, it, keep it light. But basically what I heard, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was one group of goth people who wanted to um, do more kind of like activities, like have a scavenger hunt. And then there was another group of people who were like, no, we're like just chilling and smoking. We're not doing a scavenger hunt. And this like created a rupture in the goth community. And then there was like, uh, you know, um, opposed crews of goths who would just like mean mug each other when they saw each other at the. Is that roughly what happened? And feel free to come up and elaborate because, again, I'm fascinated by this story. I, 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 so I don't quite know that story, but there was definitely between I want to go hang out, smoke a little, maybe make out, versus wanting to go party. And, you know, I, I uh, had a friend who claimed that her friend used one of the headstones from there as a coffee table, and we were all very disapproving. Yeah. Uh, I will say that back when CCA was CCAC, the best way to get into the cemetery at night was through the golf course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's always got to be a, a back way to visit the cemetery at night. Um, yeah, no, there's definitely stories that people told me off the record that they were like, you can't use my name, you can't, because some of them involved like young punk kids in the 90s stealing parts of bodies from mausoleums and, you know, definitely frowned upon. So, um, yeah, there's, there's some stories that are not uh, fit for public consumption, apparently, and uh, grave robbing is kind of where I draw the line. <laughs> um, so right next to Mountain View Cemetery is St. Mary's Cemetery, yeah. and I'm wondering, were those like simultaneously um, developed, or did St. Mary's come later, or are they related at all? Um, well, St. Mary's is the Catholic cemetery, so they're like, yeah, they're on adjacent pieces of land, but they're separate entities. I think, if I remember correctly, St. Mary's is a little bit older, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's like a year. Like, it, they opened right around the same time, but crazy story about St. Mary's, and I did a whole episode about, um, I interviewed this woman who actually lived there. She lived in the cemetery, and the story was that her family were refugees from Vietnam during the war. And um, at that time, there was like Catholic families adopting you know, Southeast Asian people who were refugees being like, hey, you can come to America, we'll set you up in a home, We'll help you get on your feet. So th this family, uh, the Nguyen's, Lord of Nguyen is the person I interviewed, um, the Catholic family was like, here's your house. And they're like, this house is in the middle of a fucking graveyard. <laughs> you know? And it's like the one house on the property. So her family kind of became like the de facto cemetery-like team. And she has crazy stories about like, you know, weird things that happened growing up, including people going there to like, um, take souvenirs, shall we say. Uh, also, the police, Oakland police, chasing a fugitive in the cemetery at night one night and like helicopters circling around. And um, yeah, so that's like one of my first episodes. That was like years and years ago I did that one. But yeah, she has crazy stories about growing up at, at St. Mary's Cemetery for sure. And it was a big family. It was like a dozen people and they like lived in the middle. It was, can you imagine moving to America? You know? <laughs> and being like, this is where we live now. <laughs> anyway, uh, we got to wrap it up, right? I think. Okay. Oh, More yeah, sure. Unless there's other people who are not presenting the program who want to ask something. Well, this is sort of a bridge question, sort of literally and figuratively. Living in San Francisco, we have no real daily experience of having graveyards or cemeteries nearby, mm -hmm. except for the little mission. Uh, cemetery and um, well, the Presidio is officially federal land, whatever. So, um, having lived in San Francisco mm -hmm. and living here and pretty much anywhere else in America, um, 
do you sense a difference having cemeteries in your life now, or mm. is there a way? Um, it just it feels a little like we are removed from a basic part of the life cycle in San Francisco. So mm. has that brought you more into? cyclical harmony now that you are in Oakland? I mean, yeah, I would say definitely. And I don't know if I like thought about it that way specifically before, but now that you mention it, like I do feel like there's something really valuable to, you know, go to a cemetery and walk around and contemplate, you know, and not one I think most of us go to a mountain view. You're not constantly thinking about death and dying and all the people that are buried there, but like it sort of seeps into your consciousness, you know, and I do think it's important, especially in a society like ours that um, I think a lot of time is very like, opposed to um, confronting mortality and things like that to have a reminder that you know life is limited and so we need to make the most of our time etc um, but also it was su it was super um, valuable to me not only for that kind of psychological reason but also when I lived over on telegraph um, it was like the, one of the closest places to go walking and have some open space so often you know if I only had like an hour or an hour and a half and I didn't have time to get up all all the way to the Oakland Hills, Joaquin Miller, Redwood Regional, I would just pop over to Mountain View and, you know, you do a lap or two there and it's an incredible, you know, you get like your exercise, you get fresh air, you see incredible things. And so I think it adds a lot to Oakland, not just even without the, all the historical relevance, just like the fact that it exists there as a resource for people to, you know, have some green space. And again, like a, in the spring when the tulips are blooming, it's incredible. I mean, uh, people have told me they've seen... Um, like bobcats there, I've seen coyotes there, so there's a lot of like natural life, there's turtles in the ponds, um, bird, incredible bird watching there. So yeah, it brings a lot, brings a lot to Oakland, absolutely, for sure. Um, and I, I, like again, I just appreciate it so much because I went to um, Arlington National Cemetery with my mom actually a couple months ago for a funeral of our, our grandma, my, my grandma, and it's so restricted. Like, you have to get, like, passes ahead of time, and it's, like, very, very, like, locked down. Even when you're going there for, like, a burial, they're, like, military. They're, like, in and out, you know? And so um, it's a beautiful place, and I know my grandma wanted to be laid to rest there with my grandfather, but, you know, as a public space, in some ways it kind of sucks, like, the experience. Like, having, like, sign all these forms and, you know, really going through the whole, like, bureaucracy, the rigmarole of even just getting access um, was a pain. So I'm really glad that we don't have to do that with Mountain View. Um, I think we need to have time to clean up the chairs and stuff before we get out of here at 7.30. So once again, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming out. Thank you to Shaping Us Up. Thank you to the Oakland Public Library, the History Center specifically, Emily and Aaron. And uh, Chris and Lisa Ruth, you guys are the best. All right, that'll do it.